If you have your Bibles, turn in them to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. And we're continuing still with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. As we read uh, the, the Scripture, would, would you rise to your feet as we read the Gospel? Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, there's all kinds of, of, of aspects of, of this, this um, passage that are, that are so important for us. But I want to begin by emphasizing the power and the importance of prayer. And, and I can't emphasize it enough. Prayer is by far the most powerful gift that God gives us. This ability for us to communicate with our Creator, to have open dialogue. With, 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 with the person who actually created all things. Like that's, that's not a small, small manner, right? This is not like having the, the, the phone that calls the bat cave. This is the ability to speak with God himself and to listen to God himself. It's kind of a big deal, right? Like, do we agree with that? Yeah? Amen? Yeah, okay. All right. Some of us agree. That's cool, all right? Look, but we, we know, right? We know that it's so important to speak with God. And this gift that he gives us is also the one that we probably take the most for granted, right, that we least utilize. Like, oh, prayer. Yeah, it's that thing I'll do when I have time. Whereas prayer should be the backdrop upon everything that we do. This communication with God should be part of everything that we are all the time. I think of the scripture that says, right, pray consistently. Pray without ceasing. And I wonder what that looks like sometimes. They think, well, does that mean that i got to sit around on my knees and pray all day long? Which would be wonderful, like if we we spent so much time. But I think, for me, I think more of Tevi from Fiddler on the Roof. You guys remember Fiddler on the Roof? How many of you guys seen Fiddler on the Roof? I love Tevi. Tevi, to me, is like, he is the embodiment of what that looks like. Because through the entire thing, he's going through all of these problems but he's always in communication with God, even when he's schnockered out of his gourd, right? This guy is drunk as all get out, and he's mad, and he's still talking to God, right? Like, and, and look, I'm not saying, pastor's not saying go home and get drunk and talk to God. Please don't do that, okay? What I'm saying is that no matter where he's at in life, for Tevi speaking to God, it's just this thing that he does. He's always talking to God. It's like it's his... his, his his friend, the person that's there, his companion. And that, to me, is what it looks like to pray without ceasing. And that's what we should be like. Like, yes, there is a time to come formally and to kneel before God. It is important to have, I believe, to, to read even written, written prayers and to repeat prayers that have been spoken by the saints to understand what those mean, to, 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 to pray um, just uh, on our own, to, to be open to the leading of the Spirit. But we should always be in communication with God. And be open to that because sometimes we're going to say anything and God's going to speak to us. I know that many times I go to do something and I can hear God. You know, it's not audible. If it was, I would probably freak out. But I know that it's God saying, That's, oh, that might be stupid. <laughs> right? And he doesn't even speak just through him. Sometimes he does it through other people, through the saints, through the angels, through the prophetic voices. Many times it's my children saying, that is a bad idea, Dad. Like, that is stupid. You're going to die. Right? That's, that's the prophetic voice of God speaking through others. So, yes, we have to embrace the power and the importance of prayer. And then there are two parts of prayer that I want us to address that, that we see in, in this passage. They are persistence and perfection. Right? I love that because you have to have, a, what is that, it's a alliteration? Persistence and, perse- pers- pers- persistence and per- perfection in prayer. That's alliteration, right? Did I use the right word? Yeah, okay, good. I was looking right at Dan. <laughs> I was like, I'm waiting for the yes or no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, you know, I learn things. Okay. So persistence is one that I think we all know about, right? We're, we're supposed to pray persistently, like Tevi, like always being on this. And even says here, the way Jesus 
says this in, in verse 7. He says, ask, it's going to be given. Search, you're going to find. Knock, and the door's going to be open for you, right? Ask, search, and knock. He's not saying like there's different ways to do it. He's not offering like three different things. First ask, then do a little looking, then knocking. This is just kind of Jesus doing his, his own um, poetic kind of justice and in, emphasizing, look, in all that you do, pray. Don't be afraid to ask. Go looking, knock. Do all of these things all the time. Be persistent in asking me what you need. Be persistent in your prayers. You need to do this all the time. These words emphasize praying to God for your needs persistently and every single day. And they even follow. They even follow exactly how Jesus had earlier taught them to pray. Y'all remember the Lord's Prayer? Right? It says, Jesus tells them earlier in, in verse 9 of, of chapter 6, when, when you pray, then pray in this way. So he says, here's how I want you to pray. If Jesus teaches you how to pray, God teaches you how to pray, we probably ought to pay attention, right? I'm just saying, like, God knows how to do this. So Jesus says, here's how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then listen to this. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, how many of us like to eat every day? Right? It's, it's pretty important that we eat every day. We need to eat regularly. And it's not like Jesus says, pray this once, and then once it's taken care of, move on to the next thing. He says, pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, I need to be praying every single day for the necessities of life. The, 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 the words of the prayer itself imply that I need to do this constantly, persistently, Pray every day. Pray all the time. So we need to pray persistently. And I think we get that part, right? We're good? We understand that? Pastor, you, you were persistent in us praying persistently. Partially. Preservative. So I'm thinking of all the P words. Like I just want to make a, a riddle. Okay. I told you guys I was off a little bit today, so you're just going to have to bear with me. Okay. The second thing, the second thing is that we need to pray perfectly. Oh. We have to pray perfectly. Now, I need to qualify that because I'm not talking about perfectly as in you need to pray in a perfectly constructed prayer or you need to pray without error. I'm talking about a prayer that follows the perfection that Jesus talks about. In the same sermon when he says in Matthew 48 or 548, what does he say? He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Isn't that weird that Jesus tells us to be perfect? I well, can't be perfect. Everybody knows we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect but God alone. So why would I even try to do that? Why would Jesus command me to do something I can't do? I feel like he's setting me up for a fail. We talked about this a little bit in youth today, that, that sometimes um, something seems like it contradicts reality or itself, and so it's up to us to recognize that the Scriptures are probably right, and reality is probably right, and that means that the problem is probably with my understanding of it. And so I might have to go in there and say, okay, I need to understand what this means to help me reconcile why it is that Jesus, Jesus, the creator of all things, the one who knows better than anybody how all things work, the one who knows better than anybody because he knows he's about to die for our imperfections, for our sins, for our flaws, that that Jesus is telling us, commanding us, that you need to be perfect as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. And it's not even a suggestion. Aim for perfection. He's saying be perfect. And this word perfect, this is why it's important, is, is this word perfect, this, this word uh, teleos, it, it just, it really doesn't mean without fault. This word that Jesus uses that we translate as perfect, sometimes as mature, sometimes as finished and fulfilled, it, it means to be towards maturity, to move towards that, be mature. To mature as a human made in the Imago Dei, to be all that God has called me to be and created me to be, right, as a human being. Or to be developed in a moral sense. Grow in that moral aspect, in our ethics, in the way that we live our lives. So this is what Jesus is calling us. And so when I say that, that, that we need to pray perfectly, what I'm talking about is praying the, the way Jesus talks about perfection as mature Christians who seek change for the will of God. And we see that even in the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy will be done. Whose will do we want done? Well, we want God's will. And I don't think any Christian would say that. We always say God's will be done. God's will be done. Lord, your will be done. But typically, if you're anything like me, you follow that up with, Lord, your will be done. But here's what I think your will should look like. Just saying. Check this out. I got an idea, Lord. What if, 
We did it this way. Ta-da! I did it. You like that? I got it. Really, all I need is you to sign off. I put it all together. Everything's good. The plan is there. I'm a planner. I am. It's a characteristic you gave me. Thank you. And I'm trying to use it for your will. So I brought this together. Here's how I need you to fix it. If you just sign right there, little thumbprint, initial, whatever it is you do, and then uh, make that happen, right? That's what we need. That's how we treat God, right? Like your will be done, but here's the will I need you to have. We need to pray where we seek change, and that's fine to seek change in something, to seek change in, 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 a, in a condition, to seek change in, in a situation, to seek change in ourselves, to seek change in others. That's perfectly fine to seek change. But we need to seek change for the will of God. Not praying like the world who seek their own path. The world, the world would pray to God and say, God, here's what I need is for you to give me this, but rather to say, okay, Lord, here's what I see, but I'm going to pray like I'm an ambassador of God because we are ambassadors of God. And so how are we reflecting God's will even when we pray? How do we do this? Okay, now you've probably heard practice makes perfect. We've all heard that. Practice makes perfect. We know this. So We just pray. That's it. We just practice, and then eventually it's going to make perfect, right? No. Because the truth is that practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. You see, if I practice bad habits, and bad habits are what we're going to develop. For example, poor posture in a sport. If I learn something, like, uh, for example, I used to, I used to coach the, the little kids in, in baseball. And when you coach little kids in baseball, uh, Danny's coached them little kids also. First off, I want to say, if you coach little kids in baseball, there's a special place in heaven for you because it's all you can do to go, stop it! I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Right? Okay. But, but the other thing is this, and, and I noticed this a lot when I coached, is because we want to be competitive, and we are as coaches. Like, I know they say it doesn't matter. Play your best. We're all competitive, yes. Even in the games where you're not supposed to keep score, I keep score. I do. I'm not going to lie, right? And any coach who tells you he doesn't is lying. Maybe. I don't know. Okay, here's the thing. But we want them to do well. And when they're little, what we learn is we can take advantage of certain situations, right? Like kids overthrow the ball. So what do we teach the kids? Hey, just keep running no matter what. Keep running, keep running, because they're never going to get you out. They can't do it. And so we teach the kids bad habits to just continue running, to never worry about it until they learn to run and then somebody starts getting them out because they develop and learn how to, to tag them out. Or we teach kids, I remember one coach would say, I always teach my kids to hold their bat. And it was a horrible, horrible posture that he had them holding their bat. It was, it was a straight up. He's like, that way when they come under, they hit it up in the air and they hit it far. And then they always get a home run because nobody can catch flies. Well, that's awesome. But now you've taught this kid to hit fly balls. And if you hit fly balls into the outfield, it doesn't take till about junior high when what happens? All you do is get out. And so we, 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 we teach bad habits by practicing poorly. So if you want to make perfect, you have to practice perfectly, right? The way you do something matters. You have to practice strumming guitar pro- uh, properly. I used, to, I used to strum guitar. I still do it horribly because I, I tell people, for me, um, the strings are evil and need to be punished, right? I, I just I beat my guitar to death. And, and my hand gets so tired, and Chris told me one day, you know you have like more than one muscle in your arm. You could actually use them joints and not tire them all out. I'm like, I know, but I taught myself this bad habit. And I don't want to change it because it's hard to change a bad habit, isn't it? It's hard to go back because for me to change that bad habit, I have to try something different. And it's going to make me a worse guitar player for a while before I get better. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do these. So we struggle with changing things. Listen, bad practice makes for bad habits. And so just practicing haphazardly doesn't do anything but teach us bad habits. If we want to run perfectly, for example... We have to practice perfectly. I thought I was a good runner. We went to team camp, and they had this game, this game where it was a relay. You would run, and then you had to take as big a bite out of the cake as you possibly could and run back. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. I can run. And when it comes to having a big mouth, bro, I'm like king. I'm going to swallow this whole cake all by myself. So Sienna goes out there, and she runs, right? And, And she does her thing, and Kyle runs, and they've both been in track, and so they're all proud of their sprinting style and all this. I go to run, I think I do good, and when I come back, they're like, Dad, that was ugly and embarrassing. Like, what? It was beautiful. It was beautiful. I was thinking it was like Olympic gold the way I was running. Apparently, like, I, like I'm flapping my wings, Kyle says, so I don't know. He says, like, you look like you're flying off. Right? I'm like, whoa, my running's fine, bro. I got there, and they're, they're don't nod. It's not, I'm ex- oh, wow. Okay, so, 
But, but here's the thing. I, I honestly, I remember Kyle when he was younger running. And Kyle's always been a runner, right? Kyle, Kyle just, he's always been going. That's what little boys do. They like never stop. And I remember even when Kyle used to run, it would remind me of, sorry, son, I'm going to have to go here. It it honestly always reminded me of the newborn gazelle, (laughs) right? (laughs) He's he's top heavy, his legs are too long, and he kind of does this number, right? And that would be Kyle. But now Kyle runs track, and it's like this perfect form, and, 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 and and it's great. And the reason is because he was told what was right. He approached that, and he practiced doing it right. And the same thing for Sienna, right? She, didn't, she wasn't born knowing how to run. She was born with gifts and talents that make her fast. But these practices. And so all of these things that we do, bad, bad habits, practicing bad habits, create bad habits. If I want to hit perfectly, I need to practice hitting perfectly. If I want to run perfectly, I need to practice running perfectly, not randomly, and certainly not with shortcuts to take the pressure and the responsibility off of ourselves. Saying, look, you don't like the way I run, coach? Maybe I need a different coach. Because right, one of the things I do know as a coach is if your kids aren't coachable, there's nothing I can do for them. They need to be willing to say, okay, what I'm doing is wrong. You know, change me. And that's tough for us. None of us like that. None of us like people to tell us to be changed. And so the same thing happens with prayer. Praying does not make perfect. Praying perfectly makes perfect. And like all things, this type of prayer requires intentional acts that are contrary to our natural behavior, even our natural thinking. And so we have to practice perfect prayer. Oh, how do we do that? Well, look what Jesus says. And in verse 9, he says, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for bread, would give it a stone? Or if your child asked for a fish, would give it a snake? We think, well, that's right. I'm a parent. My kid asked for this. I'm going to give him what's right. And to be fair, I don't, he must be talking about the good parents. Because I remember Kyle once asking me for a candy, and I gave him a salmon egg. <laughs> I, I'm not that good of a parent. I'm just saying. My kids, my kids are going to need therapy. I'm, I'm not that good of a parent. <laughs> he did not like that candy. Do you want some more? Oh, thank you. It's so cute. Oh, man, I miss cute Kyle. Now, now he's 15-year-old Kyle. <laughs> Sorry, son, I'll have some money for you after church. <laughs> we, we may have to actually start imposing fines when the pastor preaches about the kids. I would have nothing to preach about and I'd be broke. So, Okay, but, but these things, but look what happens here. The things that they ask for, these aren't even things that children usually ask for, are they? Because children, when they ask for things, they usually ask for selfish or naive things, right? Dad, I'm hungry. Oh, well, I made dinner. There's pot roast up there. Oh, I don't want that. What do you mean you don't want that? Can I I have a quesadilla? You just said you were hungry. You wanted food. I made you food. Like I slaved over a a hot microwave when I put that in the package there and put it in there for you. Again, I'm not that good of a parent. I don't want that. I want this. Can I, can I, can I eat cereal instead? Oh. Right? Well, why? Because, to be fair, we ask for what we want, not really what we need. And why is it that I don't want my kids eating cereal every night? Although I admit, look, I am the worst. I eat cereal for dinner anytime I can. I love cereal. That, that, that explains to you, right? I love cereal. But it's not healthy, right? They, they need to practice things. So they don't ask usually for the right stuff. They're, my kids are not going to say, Dad, can I have a piece of bread and, and some fish? Because if they want bread, it's so that they can make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches instead of eating dinner. But these children, the ones that Jesus talks about, they don't ask for selfish things or naive things. And then the reason these don't is because in this story, the children are us. It's the people of God. He's using this just as an example. And, and Jesus, Jesus is God. God is the Father in this story. In other words, he's telling us as believers, we're not supposed to ask in selfishness or with immaturity. We're supposed to ask things that that the children of God would ask for, the disciples would ask for, that that mature, teleos Christians would ask for. These children, in Jesus' example, ask for real necessities. And this, this I think, is where we really struggle with prayer and honestly with with, with, prayer. Definitely with prayer, but prayer as a foundation for everything else that we do in our walk with God. You see, 
We as Christians, we want to harness the power of God. We do. We want to harness the power of God to change all the things in our world. And that's good. I want to harness the power of God to change my habits. I want to harness the power of God to make me a better person. I want to harness the power of God to protect my marriage. I want to harness the power of God to protect my family. I want to harness the power of God to help me succeed in life. I want to harness the power of God to make me more likable. I want to harness the power of God to save the world, to feed the hungry, to do all of these things, right? That's good. It's good that we want to harness the power of God to do all of these things. That is what we are supposed to do. We do so usually with the minds of naive and selfish children rather than as wise and mature disciples. And we tend to pray more like Janis Joplin, right? Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches. I must make amends. I want to sing it, but, but I, I promise there'll be less singing in the church. <laughs> oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? No? Just <laughs> Okay. Look, but that's what we do, right? Here's what I need, God. I need to get around, and so I need a Mercedes Benz if you'll just give me that. The most of us, the problem isn't that we're too eager to ask for the wrong things. It's not like we say, God, I want you to do this horrible thing for somebody else, or I want you to do this. It's not that we want to ask for the wrong things. The problem is we're never eager to ask for the right things. And so that only leaves us with the wrong things. It's not like we want to start there, but the right things, the right things are usually where we don't like talking to God. I want to eat. I just don't like meatloaf. I want to eat. I just don't like this. I want to drink. I'm thirsty. I just don't like water. I mean, think about the silliness of that. We've all heard it from our kids. I'm thirsty. There's water. Really? Like water is the the par excellence answer to thirst. But I don't want it. What do you want? I want a soda. Or any more. I want a Red Bull. What? We want things, but we typically want the wrong things. Whether it's out of selfishness or fear or naivety of reality, we don't want the things, we don't want to ask for the things that we actually need. For example, praying that God would fix something or provide something in a way that doesn't inconvenience us. We do that a lot. Lord, I need you to fix this. I need to do that. But I don't want it to inconvenience me. I mean, to to continue picking on my children... The children would pray every day that I would wash the dishes instead of just praying, Lord, help me to develop a good work ethic, right? Or or a person, to be fair, who asks for a handout rather than a solution to the situation. It happens. But then on the other end of that is the person who wants to end the homeless situation or or the immigration situation or, or the lack of care for veterans situation, but doesn't want to actually change the system that benefits them. Yeah, I want that fixed, taken care of, but I don't want it to inconvenience me. Or perhaps, we don't, we don't like the, the sphere of calling ourselves into it, so we don't like to call our own faults into question and require us to change. I don't want to own my own participation in this problem. I don't want to change, I want them to. Christians who pray against evil but refuse to acknowledge and work in their own sins, their own vices, their own issues. And we all do this, Christians or not, we, we tend to want other people to get fixed. Uh, Dr. Scott Daniels, who I think is um, my favorite preacher in the whole world and was recently elected as, as our newest general superintendent, he tells a story, um, he, he often tells a story about when he was in seminary and him and his, and his wife, Debbie, were just about to get married. And in, in the, the, the school that he was at, they also had a uh, counseling program. And as part of the counseling program, the students were to bring in people and do um, free counseling, you know, to kind of like help learn what they're doing and how to do this. And so he was invited. Hey, we were doing a marriage counseling thing for people coming together. Would you and and Debbie like to come be a part of it? And he says, man, I thought that's brilliant. Yes, of course. First off, I get to help the school. I love that. Um, I'm about to get married. I think it's a good idea. And the next thing is she really does need someone to kind of tell her some of the flaws that she has. He said, he's open. He says, I thought this would do her really good. Like, she needed to speak to a therapist. And I was going to go there and help her be a part of this. He says, so we got there and we did it. And it turns out I'm the crazy one. 
Right? He says, I, didn't, I don't go in there expecting it to be me. We never do. It's always them. It's always them. And whatever problem, and I pick on marriages because we do that with those, but it's, it's almost in everything that we do. Whenever we have a problem, whatever it is, with the friend, with the system, with the government, it's always them, not me. They need to get fixed. They need to help. They need to do this. And I just want to encourage them to get help. Lord, help them to get the help that they need so they can fix so it no longer attacks me. Because we don't want to call our own faults into, into question. We're afraid of being a part of it. Or we definitely don't like praying sometimes in a way that's, that makes sense. We, we struggle sometimes because we want to pray in a way that's contrary to reality, but if it's our own delusions of how we insist the world must be behaving. This is where I think it is, um, and this is the only way it can be, and so this is what I need fixed. I need, I, need, I need people to start listening to QAnon. I can't believe how many people pray that the world will start listening to QAnon. If you haven't heard me say this before, I'll say it right now again. QAnon is a prior excellence example of the Antichrist, right? It's, it's people using the name of God to do things absolutely unbiblical, absolutely contrary to the word of God. And I'm blown away at how many people have said, well, I'm delusional of reality and I want this to be this way. Or to pray other things that aren't there. I believe that if I get in a relationship with this person, if I would just have sex with them, then they would like me more, right? That's delusional. Or to believe that, that, that this can fix this problem. Or if I do this, or more money can fix this, or this can fix that. We use these, these, these fantasy, romantic ideas that are not real to try to fix our world because we're delusional of reality. And we want God to participate in our delusions. Lord, if you would just give me this, then everything would be great. My mom used to say that all the time, and I, and I love my mom, so don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but my mom would often say, if I could just win the lottery, I think everything would get fixed. And, and I got to tell you, my mom's put so much money into the lottery, into that dream, into that hope, and nothing's gotten fixed. And I guarantee that even if she'd have won it, it wouldn't have fixed everything. Right? We can say these things out loud, but we still want to try it and participate. I know money doesn't fix everything. But I'd sure like to take a swing at it. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> right? Maybe money can't bring you happiness, but money buys tacos, and that's pretty close. Or a burrito, there you go. And, and this one I think is the most difficult for us. It's, it's separating, trying to... to, to the word that I'm looking for, to discern what is real from what is fantasy. This is hard for all of us because none of us have a full grasp of reality. I mean, we barely have a full grasp of reality in our own little bubbles. We have no grasp on reality in the world around us. We have a lot of blanks, a lot of empty spots that we fill in with fear and, 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 and selfishness. And then we end up praying based on that fear and that selfishness. So how do we discern what is real from what is fake? In Proverbs 12, God says, Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to advice. Now let, let's start here with this one. I was sharing with the youth this morning, never walk into any argument, I hate to use the word argument, but any, any, any conversation, unless you're willing to walk in with the full concession that you might be wrong, okay? In any conversation, in any discrepancy, in anything that you have an issue with, if you can't walk into that conversation with the full con with the concession that you might be wrong, you might be wrong, then you have no business even going into that conversation because nothing good is going to come from it. It's not dialogue at that point, it's a debate. That is the fool. The fool thinks that their way is right. I'm right. I just need to tell you why I'm right. I remember being an arrogant jerk once um, uh, when I was working at, at American Fence and one of the, the, the crew foremen had come in and we, he was trying to solve some kind of a math problem. And um, I remember he said, yeah, if, if this shoots at this many feet per second, it's this. And I was like, uh, actually, no, it's not. I said, it's actually closer to this. And um, he was like, no. I was like, no, I'm, I'm right. And so he goes, and he checks the math, and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you are right. He says, let me show you why. And in arrogance, I said, oh, I know why. I'm right. Like, what a jerk. <laughs> but that made me a fool. I was an absolute fool because I was assumed that my way had to be right. I could have just as easily been wrong or made a mistake. Santa pointed out earlier, like, no matter what, sometimes we make dumb mistakes. 
We have to be willing to say, yeah, that was dumb, and laugh about it and move on. If we're not always right, it's only the fool thinks they're always right. So if you go into any conversation saying, I know I'm right, I know why I'm right, you are a fool. But the wise listen to advice. And I love that this is the difference. It doesn't say the wise admit they're wrong. The wise listen to advice. This is one that this church body has taught me. I think this is the lesson I've learned from this church body over the last five years more than any, anything else I've learned here or, or more than anybody has ever taught me. And, and I hear over and over again, hey, pastor, maybe you should get some counsel about that. Hey, pastor, maybe you should talk to some people and take some time to think about that. Because I really am, right? I am a ready, fire, aim kind of person. And, and, and that, that, that is the fool's way. That, that is that arrogance. That is that I already know my way is right. But, but the wise are the ones who listen to advice. So listen to the advice of others, right? Listen to what others have to say to you. Let people speak into your life, even so you know how to pray, so you know what to ask God for. You know, what, what should you think I should pray for? Like, I'm having this struggle. How should I pray? What do you think? I want to pray this way. I want to pray that they would get help. But, but how do you feel about this? Because the wise listen to advice. But here's the other thing. you got to be mindful about who you get advice from. Let me, let, me, let me tell you something that really sounds stupid. This is how much of a fool I was, right? And this was during about the same part of my life. I was sitting in jail one day. I woke up in jail. And um, there I was thinking, okay, how am I going to get out of this one? Right? So there I am. I'm in jail. And if I'm in jail, you know, it's because I broke the law, right? That's why they arrest you. Turns out there's not a giant conspiracy or anything. Um, the police don't actually like arresting you because now they have paperwork to do. Turns out I was an inconvenience upon them as well. So it wasn't just an inconvenience on me. So there I was in jail thinking, man, this doesn't seem right. It feels unjust. Because everybody in jail, like, it's unjust. It, it was unjust the way they arrested me. Yes, I was drinking and driving. But that's beside the point. He didn't have the right to do what he did. That's what I thought. And so I needed advice. And there I was sharing my problems with a fellow cellmate who was also in there because they were doing wonderful things for society, right? Um, and that cellmate says, you know what? You're right. Legally, they can't do that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And so I sat there and I let this person who was sitting in jail next to me give me legal advice for about the next two hours to help me plot a plan so I could get out of this dilemma that I got into. Now, how many of y'all see the stupidity in that? Right? Everyone should be raising their hand. And if, if you don't think you should raise your hand, raise it anyway, because here's the thing. Do not take legal advice from a person who has proven existentially that they can't keep the law. Right? That's just dumb. That's like taking financial advice from broke people, right? Like, don't take advice from people who fail. And there I was taking advice. And I say that to say this, that very often I, I see this, and I've seen this a lot recently. People who struggle with the situation saying, I don't know what I should do, and they t- listen to the counsel of people. Well, okay, but here's what these people are telling me. Oh, yeah, that person's in jail with you. Maybe you shouldn't be taking advice from them. No, no, that, that's where I want. We need to seek good advice, not affirmation. And, and many times, that's what we want. I just want affirmation. I'm going to find the person who's going to agree with me and tell me what's wrong. I wanted that person to speak. The lawyer could have sat there, and I went to my lawyer. My lawyer was a jerk. My lawyer said, you're guilty. You need to plead guilty. I'm like, what am I paying you for? Like, this guy was sitting there for free. He offered me a cookie and legal advice. We want affirmation, not advice. Because we're okay with being wrong. We're okay with being broken. We're okay with sitting in jail so long as someone else tells us, you're right, you're a victim, don't you worry about it. And it happens so often in the church. And it's frustrating as a pastor. The psalmist says, and this is, I love this, this is the first two verses of the psalms. Happy are those who don't follow the advice of the wicked. Do you know that if I would have stopped taking advice from criminals, I probably would have stopped going to jail a lot sooner? I'm just saying, even in and out of jail. Oh, you're allowed to drive and drink so long as they don't see the keys in your hand. I remember getting pulled over and throwing the keys out the window. Like, ha! Now I lost my keys and I'm going to jail. <laughs> right? These, these things are ridiculous. So happy is the one 
who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take this path that sinners tread. Don't follow the broken. Look, if, I want, if I'm doing something and, I, and, and as a pastor, people typically come to me because they have sinful problems, right? I'm like, well, maybe you should do this. Yeah, but so-and-so says that I should do this. I'm like, so-and-so is doing it too, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you don't take the advice on sin from people who sin. Or sit at the seat of scoffers. But instead, their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, they meditate day and night. See, as a pastor, this one might be the most heartbreaking and frustrating, and that is that the people tend to come to me really looking for affirmation rather than counsel. And, and if you come for me, come to me looking for something, I'm, I'm going to give you counsel, not affirmation. And, and that's my warning now, because I'm not going to lie, it, it, it really is frustrating, and it's, it's taxing. And how many people get angry because they don't affirm what they want and do things the way that they want, but rather say, well, this is what you actually need. We are the pastor. You should help me. Why didn't you help me? That's what you need is right there. That's not what I asked for. I asked for this. Pastor, I have this problem. I'd like you to help me fix it. Okay, here's what you need to do. No, no, I'm not doing that. I need you to fix it like this. And, and this, is, this is where we end up in so many things that we do. And this attitude is a hardening of the heart that's, that's caused when we pray selfishly, fearfully, or naively. But we need to pray perfectly. Because if we do not practice praying perfectly, we'll never develop the spiritual, mental, or the physical skills that we need in order to participate in God's will for each situation in life. If we don't do this, we're going to actually participate in making the chaos of our world even worse. But within this kingdom prayer that Jesus teaches, as well as his praying for God's will to be done on earth, we are taught, we the believers, are taught to pray for we, what we ourselves need right here and right now. But what's stopping us? What stops us from praying for what we actually need rather than what we want? Really, it's just bad prayer habits. Not praying perfectly. Let me finish with this. Jesus teaches us. He says in verse 11, if you then who are evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, right? so even as messed up as where we give good gifts to your children, like, I'm not the greatest father. I joke about that, but honestly, I think I'm a pretty good dad. I really do. Like, I got all four of my kids, and, and, and they're, they're, they're all pretty good kids, right? I, I don't think they've joined a gang, although I think Isaac may have started one by accident. It's all cool. My bad. It's cool, buddy. We're all right, right? Like, like I really do. You guys know this. Like, I have good kids. I think I have good kids. And, and I know I failed, but I think I'm a pretty, pretty decent dad, right? Because I love them, like we all are. And I'm not saying that pat my back. I'm saying, like, we as parents, like, we all know we're not great, but we all know, you know what, we're not bad either. Because if we thought we were horrible parents, we'd be like, somebody else take care of my kids because I can't do it. And so we, we do the best, and we think we're doing this. But even as much as I would do good for my kids, I know that I'm evil, that I'm going to mess up. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven get good gifts to those who ask him? If my kids ask me for, for ice cream for breakfast, I'd be like, no, nah, man. But, but I did make some arroz con leche. So, you know, we'll pretty much have that. It's all good. How much more is God going to give us what we really need if we ask him for what we need? If my kids come to me and say, Dad, we really do need bread or I need some food or, you know what, Dad, I need, I need electrolytes, right? Like that was actually a conversation in our house. Okay, let's make that happen. But how much more is God who loves us more than I love my kids going to answer that prayer if we ask for what we truly need rather than what we want? You see, God works on us like, like an artist working with difficult material. And friends, we are difficult material. I know I am. And prayer is the way that some of that material cooperates with the artist instead of resisting him. I say, you know what? I am here to listen to you. So I know I need to do this. Help me to do this, to follow you, to do your will, and to act out the things that you've called me to do. Because we are difficult, but God is loving, and he calls us to work with him. Prayer is so huge, so important. And I get it. I've been doing a lot of praying lately, and, and, and I know that a lot of my prayers are, here's what I need you to fix, God. But what I realize is God keeps responding to, here's what you need to do. And so we're going to, I'm going to try listening to God. Let's see how that works. 
<laughs> no, of course. But, but I, I just say that to say, look, if you're wrestling, don't, don't feel ashamed or hurt about it. I, I wrestle too. And I know I'm not the greatest pastor in the world. I'm sure there's some out there who are amazing prayer warriors. We're all in this together. So pray and be honest and seek those things that we actually need rather than what we want. Amen? I'm going to invite the team to come up and we'll, we'll, we'll close off with a, with a wonderful song of worship. Lord, I love you and I thank you. Because there truly is nothing else that we need but you and your presence. It's your presence that brings order from the chaos. It's your presence that, that brought the light from the darkness. It's your presence into this world through the incarnate Christ that brought pockets of heaven throughout our world. It was your presence that Pentecost that transformed the people to become this church that could go out and bring them pockets of heaven as well. And it's your presence even now, Lord, that convicts us and transforms us. And so we pray for your will, for your presence in our lives. And that we would embrace it and allow it to come in and to work in all the areas of our lives that we struggle with. That we would practice praying perfectly and persistently to you, Lord. Praying for your will, listening to your voice. And when you call us out, Father, instead of resisting, rejoicing that you love us so much that you would call out what is really happening so that we may follow you and grow and live. We may do... Exactly as you said through the prophet Isaiah. That we would seek you, that we would turn, and that we would live. So bring us life, Father, we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.